Welcome back. Miguel Dorati here with the MMA Museum podcast. And I am joined by UFC 6 uh, main draw veteran, Rud- Rudger Mankayo. And uh, Rudger, how are you? I'm doing well, man. Thanks. Thanks for having me on your podcast. No, definitely very nice uh, to have you aboard here. Uh, you know, the MMA Museum, we're looking at, you know, trying to document some of the history that, uh, you know, slowly but surely could be forgotten if we're not careful. And I think that uh, UFC 6 is one of those that, you know, you can come back to over and over and get a new twist on. It's just such, uh, you know, a key part of history. And uh, you were in the main draw. So what, why don't you tell people, this is putting things together. I think you were about 22 years old. Right. Uh, I was young. Yeah. You had a, like a, a background in like weightlifting, modeling, and uh, from California. Right. Yeah. And somehow this translates to you being introduced into the UFC as being 78 and 0 and from Ecuador. So take us through getting into the UFC. Sure. Well, first of all, that 78 and 0, that was just obnoxious marketing. That's that's not a real record. Okay. So okay. let me just throw that off the bat. And the other thing I want to say is being handsome really opens a lot of doors. It gets you in. And you, you know what? So once you're in the door, you just have to do the work. You just put the work in, but it, it okay, definitely helped. It. <laughs> so, um, so this is, so yes, I was modeling. Uh, I was also doing stunts. And what happened, the, I, it was, the way I got into the UFC was really unintentional. It's not something that I really set out to do. Um, I was watching TV and I was dating this girl at the time and her dad was watching a UFC show. Okay. And then I happened to see Pat Smith. You, you know, I saw that. And then it was just the weirdest feeling. It's just like, oh, wow. Uh, I feel like I'm going to end up fighting that guy at some point in my life. And that was the, that was it. And I just, you, you know, I didn't give it much thought because I wasn't competing. I wasn't really interested in joining or doing the UFC. Um, however, I was boxing. At the time, and I was going to this gym in Westminster, California, called Westminster Boxing Gym. So I'd go and train there. My coach was this guy named Marvin. And then every Friday night and Saturday nights, we'd have uh, just some friendly boxing matches. So I'd be there every Friday and Saturday night, just, you know, playing around. So that that was my, you know, my my fighting thing. You know, right okay. there. Um, so let me digress a little bit. So after I saw that, maybe... I don't even remember the timeline. Maybe it was a month, three weeks, you know, but maybe two months in that time frame. Uh, my uncle gets in touch with me and he says, hey, there's this thing. It's called uh, the Ultimate Fighting Championship. And we know that you like to fight. Uh, we want to know if I want to know if you want to represent Ecuador. So the reason he was asking because he's a big fight fan. He likes fighting. Um he, he used to box, you know, he used to box also. And he's in um, Ecuador. In Ecuador, you're right. Oh, you'd um, have to be a huge fighting fan to have heard of the UFC in Ecuador back in the Well, 90s. they were showing it over there. It, it was being streamed. So they, they oh. were watching it already. Okay, so cool. I think, though, I think it might have been behind. I, I'm not sure which one he was actually watching, you know, but okay. he just told me about it. And I said, you know what, let me think about it. It's not really something that, you know, I've, I have anything on my radar. I'm pretty busy. Um, long story short, I ended up saying yes, obviously. And then he sent me this really nice uh, letter. And, and just the way it was written, it was so old school. <laughs> it was like a carbon copy paper. It was like written out of the 50s. So he sent me that. Um, I put a portfolio together with some of my wrestling matches and some of my boxing matches and just some pictures. I just put a nice portfolio together and I sent it out to Wow Entertainment, uh, you know, which was with Art David at the time. And I think within three weeks or so, I, I received a call from Art David and said, hey, I'm looking at your packet. Why don't you come down to Torrance and talk to me and let's see um, if we can put something together. Um, so that's how that started. So that's pretty much how I got into the UFC. And, and so your uncle wrote a letter from Ecuador, like, you right. know, recognizing you as a Karate artist? Because that's, I right. think, what how they introduce you. Okay. Yeah, you know, and I, I have done karate. I did do karate. Uh, it was full contact karate. And you know what? Um, 
I, I know a lot of people laugh at it and they think it's funny, but you know what the discipline I got from that, just showing up and training, it, it was, it just really set a really good template for the rest of my life. It's just really good. And I think any, any, any young person that can get into any consistency, they'll, they're going to develop discipline. Okay, so sure. that really helped me with a lot of my discipline that I have now. At that point, you know, in the UFC, um, you could still run into a guy that that would be enough against. You know what I mean? Right. Because real legit, just brawler, tough guys there. Um, you know, uh, we're going to get into it. Unfortunately, that you know, you didn't get any of those guys. You got real skilled guys, but but uh, so you apply. Art Davy gets the letter. He calls you. The fights are in Denver. Who who went? Who accompanied you to Denver? What was what was the deal there? All right. So, um, in between time, what what had happened was I had met this guy named Chemo. Okay, so that's where Joe Song comes into. He was him and Joe Song were really good friends, and we started training. Okay, um, we had we had met before I even wanted to participate in the UFC. So I was helping him train. You know, like I said, I was boxing and. Uh, before that, I had wrestling, even though I did not wrestle in high school. I still wrestled at the Salvation Army. I wrestled at this place called the Jerome Center. Um, I picked up wrestling classes at Santa Ana College. You know, so I, I did stuff just for myself. The reason being is because I wasn't able to participate in after school sports. I had to take care of my brother. And I also had a business to manage. Okay, so we had a, we had a, uh, a home development company so what we would do is we buy land build homes so i was part of that company okay so my focus was on that and then also taking care of my brother uh, and, and it was really hard to say no to my dad so you know basically i did what he said to do so that that's why i wasn't able to participate in after school sports so i did have experience with the wrestling and the boxing okay and that's what i was you know, sharing those techniques with chemo. So we would go and train. Uh, we started going to, um, uh, we, we, we just started training. We just built up, built up a friendship from there. Yeah. There, there's a lot of people like back then, you know, Chris Brennan, I think you actually worked your corner that day. Um, he was from the area. He knew you, um, you know, I think you guys met by chance in Denver. I don't think he went with you as your original corner man. That's the story I heard. Uh, well, no. What you was like, because you you also come under uh, Todd Medina's name, and uh, you know, describe all those relationships a little bit. So most of these connections were very loose ties connections. Uh, Todd's a good guy. You know, I don't really know him that well, but from what I did know of him, he was a good person. He helped me get into the UFC. He's the one that uh, kind of introduced me. You know, when I was putting the 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 packet together, said, "Hey, who do I send this out to?" And he he kind of helped me out. Okay, um, as far as training, he did go and train with us a few times uh, with Kimo and myself. Um, but like I said, they were all loose ties connections. Uh, we only had that one thing in common. Now with Chris Brennan, I didn't really know Chris Brennan that well. I just met him a few times because um, I was training. I went and took some class, I think, with um, Kenny Gabrielson. Uh, from okay. what I believe, and that's where everybody was was going training out of his garage. And what happened with UFC is Chris showed up with another guy. He just popped in there. Okay, so I said, you know what? Yeah, you know what? It's not a problem. Go ahead, go for it. But up to that point, once I got into the UFC, uh, Kimo and I had had a fallout. So just stopped training. Didn't really, and it, it was just all based on I think me being in the UFC. I really don't know why, you know, that, you know, that would have caused the fallout, mm -hmm. but, um, so a lot of train, early days, yeah. you know, a lot of type a guys and, and chemo, you know, would I probably be near the top of the list, you know? Yeah. So just stop training, you know, and that's kind of like when the friendship started dissolving. I mean, we're not enemies. I don't really, I haven't had contact with him in years. It's just, that's when everything just started going south. So I was pretty much by myself. I just started training by myself. And you know what? I just did the best I could with it. And I managed that situation. So when I, I arrived in Denver, uh, the person that, you know, I had originally, originally connected with was Todd. He went with me. I got him a ticket. And at that time, it was two two hotel rooms or something like that. You can just, you know, 
I think I either paid for his hotel room or the UFC paid for the other hotel room and he stayed there. Well, what was the appearance fee? How much did you get paid for UFC 6? So for UFC 6, I got paid a total of $5,000. I had negotiated with him to get a little bit of a higher fee. And the reason I was able to negotiate a higher fee is because my dad was a partner with the radio station. He, we had a radio station in San Diego. So, uh, you know, I just said, you know, we can talk about this and we can, you know, uh, put it out in the air and we can uh, really just get the Latino fans involved. So that's that's I just got a little bit more money, which is really not a lot. Yeah. You know, but you know, but for the so time, I mean, that was more, a lot of people started a little bit less. That's cool because you went into a really, really tough draw. It's, you were the smallest guy there. Right. Uh, you know, you had your premonition kind of thing where, you know, that you might fight Pat Smith. And lo and behold, you know, standing across from you is Pat Smith. And, you know, notably, you know, Pat was rugged in the first couple of UFCs. Obviously, you know, you, you probably saw that, you know. Um, and he had that, that killer instinct. But, right. he, you know, just to be quite honest, and may he rest in peace, but he looked big and roided for UFC 6. You know what I mean? Right. He looked a, yeah. lot, a lot more ripped and, a, you know, a little meaner, you know. So that was a really tough draw. How Talk about the pre-fight experience of all that. So what had happened was I was weighing, I think I was weighing 165 to 170 pounds. So I put on, I think, 35 to 40 pounds to get to... I think I was a little bit over 200. I mean, you can really tell I was just, you know, pudgy. Um, and I think that was in the conversation with Art. He said, you know, you're going to be the smallest guy in there. Um, can you, you know, maybe put on a little bit of weight, you know, because these guys are, everybody's going to be big. Everybody's going to be big. So um, I said, you know what, I'll do my best. You know, I'll go in there. You know, so basically all that was just food weight. And then I, when a few months later, when I fought in Battle Cade Extreme Fighting, you can see my, my body shape starting to come back down. I was in a lot better shape. But for that, it, it was just like a shit show. It, I had, you, you know what, uh, a shit corner. Not that they're, the people were shits, just, you know, I had nothing in common with those guys. It's yeah, really no nothing. Plan. Yeah, no game plan, nothing. Um, you, you know what, also, my maturity at that level, it really wasn't, it, it really wasn't there. I was really more into party scenes and um, just girls. So the night before, I just stayed up playing around with a bunch of girls, just fucking around until the morning. The morning, I just didn't even go to bed, just went, got up. I think we did the press conference. I was still, you, you know, buzzed. Just, yeah, just buzzed and smelling like girls. Yeah. Um, so basically, that was my mindset at that moment. You know, it's just, you know. Now, did you get, did, you know, and believe it or not, you know, the chaos of the, of the of the live events, you know, you hear similar stories, even Mark Coleman, people like that talk very similar stories in Brazil and things like that. There's an allure and a party scene around the fights that happens. That's a famous after fight party too. So we'll yeah. get there. Um, but, uh, you know, in the main, in the main, you got Tank there, you got Paul Varlins, who's massive and also a very, you know, in your face, like you know, like not cool to his opponents kind of guy. You know, I mean, what was the tension like, like in the hotel before? Because afterwards there were even brawls, and hopefully, you know, we'll mention some of that. Well, the only tension was with uh, with Dave with Tank Abbott. Uh, he he was definitely looking looking for trouble. So a lot of the stuff was just based around him. Paul Varlins, um, all the other guys, it, it was really nothing. Pat Smith, nothing like that. It wasn't anything. It was just very topical stuff, nothing. It, it, it wasn't, nobody was in anybody's face. Everybody pretty much stuck to themselves. Um, but okay. with Tank, yeah, definitely, like, he was looking for problems. And, you know, I think uh, in the back room before one of the fights, he had gotten into a small scuffle with with uh, Pat with Pat Smith, you know, before that, but that was quickly broken up. And then again, I think you're alluding to the elevator incident when the attacks when Tank attacked uh, Pat as we were getting out of the elevator. Um, but yeah, it was just everything pretty much all the tension at, at that particular event was instigated by 
by Tank Abbott. Everybody else was very cool. They were just very respectful, friendly, N nothing, you know, nothing. What, what hotel were you guys in? You know, I do not remember. I, I okay. do not remember the name of the hotel, but I'll tell you some good stuff afterwards, which. Um, <laughs> you, you know. Okay. Um, so, you know, the fight goes down. It's kind of a famous fight because, you know, Pat was typically aggressive and, you know, you got your early kind of thing. I, I've heard you talk about it, how like you were going to do, you know, like a fist bump kind of. Yeah, just a, a little, a little dab, you know, like the, like the fighters do now, you know, that's what I was used to, you know, so that's it caught me off guard. I mean, you can see, you can see me putting my hand up just to give him a, you know, fist bump. And I'm like, Oh shit, he's coming at me. He, you know, so he did get me by surprise. Uh, he got me right in the middle of the chest. Um, I, I was not able to breathe. It was just, you know, very disheartening. I'm like, Oh shit. I can't fucking take a deep breath. You know, and I'm trying to take a deep breath. I'm trying to like keep going. And, and I, you know, it wasn't, I, nothing was coming out. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, you know, shit happens. Yeah. I would have liked to had a better showing with, with Pat. I'm, I'm confident. Even then at that point, I was confident that, you know, I'd be able to beat him just with that basic wrestling that I had, I would have been able to beat him. You, you know, what's really interesting is, you know, people remember that fight and everything like that, but it was such a crazy and aggressive tournament. You had Tank, you know, in his first fight, and he wiped out Matua in the fan, and he made fun of him afterwards. That famous yeah. scene. You, know? you had Oleg coming off just losing the tournament, as focused as you're ever going to get him. Right. He wiped out Benito. Um, the other, the uh, fourth fight in there, which is escaping me right now at the moment, but oh, uh, Varlins and Worsham. Varlins probably got banged up in that fight a little bit because him and Worsham were swinging, but you probably did more damage to Pat, and Pat spent more time beating you than any of the other guys in round one. So you, you put, and then Pat didn't continue. What happened in that fight? I ended up hurting his ribs. Uh, not many. I don't think that was really known. I ended up hurting his ribs uh, when we were against the fence, and you can see me throwing some punches into his midsection. Um, yeah, and then your head turned up, but you you had some good clean shots in there when right. you were. So up. I can hear him going, <clears throat> you know, as I'm punching him. Um, you know, I think that's the most damage I did. And then he did get me when we felt her four. He did get me in that, um, you know, kind kind of like a bulldog choke or a rear naked choke or you know whatever it was. You know, so. Um, I, I but, think it was just aggressive, you know, really, yeah, more than technical. But, but, uh, but, yeah, he, he, it was, it was a situation where a lot of people think that that's the reason why Tank and him had a problem is that he felt that he shouldn't continue because what happened is Anthony Macias stepped in, right? He was the alternate who had won his fight, but Anthony Macias, you know. He had the same manager as Oleg, a guy named Buddy Alvin, mm -hmm. and they had trained together, and that fight lasted 10 seconds, giving Oleg about a minute. Easy. Yeah. Two fights, an easy path, and, and, and eventually Oleg beat Tank. So do you think that's the source of the problem? You know, I really don't know. I, I can't really speak on that. I just think the source of the problem was Tank. <laughs> you know, So that's what I'm going to focus on. Uh, he had a really bad attitude at the time. Uh, I know he has softened out now, you know, now that he's older. Uh, but, you know, just from day one, I think he was just making his presence known. And I think he was just doing what he does, you know, what he would do at any show. Just kind of, you, you know, uh, just try to fight. Now, I heard that one of the contacts you made at this show was Phyllis Lee. Right. Phyllis became my manager for, for a while. Yeah. Uh -huh. This is a subject dear to our heart because Phyllis is definitely a, a relic of an age gone by, but, but a yeah. fascinating character. Oh. Uh, um, so she approached you at UFC 6. She would have been there with Severn, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, she did approach me at UFC 6. Uh, and, you know, we just started talking and she gave me her card and I gave her my number. So um, we did end up connecting. And, you know, you just mentioned hook and shoot. She was trying to get me into those those type of fights, you know, pain brace, hook and shoot. She was trying to take me over to Japan. However, I was very torn at the moment. Uh, you know, like I had mentioned before, I, this, this the, the UFC fight was something 
I wanted to do, but not really want to do. I was 50-50. I did it more because I was asked to do it. It really was not something that I would have pursued uh, organically on my own. You know, I just had that motivation from my uncle, you know, that wanted me to represent Ecuador behind it. Uh, however, that did open, that kind of like just said, you know what, this is actually kind of fun. I get to go out and do stuff, lost some steam, meet some cool people. Um, so that that is in that area. So when she was trying to get me, Phyllis, when Phyllis was trying to get me to Japan, hook and shoe and other things, it was really hard for me to justify the amount of money that I would make on these based on what I was currently making. And, sure. and it just didn't, you know, for me, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. And it, it, it was really hard justifying. And also, I know um, if I would have gotten my face hurt in that particular area, a lot of my work would have been delayed or just blown off. And that was actually, that was very lucrative for me at the point. And it was getting more lucrative. The other thing that was really working out was stunts. I started off with doing things on the Power Ranger and it was just picking up. And the moment that it picked up was that kick. Okay, so when I was kicked, that following week from me getting home, my phone was just blowing up every day, at least 30, 40 messages a day. Hey, are you the Red Deer Bunkayo? They got kicked in the UFC. We'd like to talk to you. Hey, have you thought about this is social with um, something management? We saw your fight. Let's talk. And that really opened the door for me for stunts. So even though I had already started doing some stunts, it just really just kind of it's just catapulted me. And then you had mentioned John Peretti. John Peretti, you know, he's the one that opened the window. So that opened the door for me. He just opened the windows for stunts. And that just really got me going with that. And that's what's really was my focus. Um, you know, so that's why you don't really see me too much in 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 MMA or, you know, those type of fights in, in that time period. Sure. And that makes sense. I mean, you know, at Hook and Shoot, we, you know, to bring a person in, you know, from California was a plane ticket and hotels and, you know, you know, a couple hundred bucks for the fight or whatever. And, and sh sure, you're not the you're not the only guy that said, you know, thanks, but no thanks. We had a little bit of a reputation. Some guys said, I'll do it to test our, themselves, you know, and, and we had a little bit of value that way. Japan was a little more alluring, but at the end of the day, Phyllis probably offered you about $1,200, you know, for the trip to I Japan. I think so, yeah. And so, right. yeah, what she used to do, it's 15, and she would take three. And then when she gave you 12, she'd ask you for another, you know, she was a clever, clever old lady. But, um, yeah, uh, I, I'm good on you that it wasn't worth your money, you know, your, the, that you were doing better than that. Because if you had to do it for the money, it, it was a rough going back then. Um, right. But, but didn't Japan, you, you said you were into the party scene. That didn't, you didn't, you didn't want to go once? <laughs> no. It, okay. It's not that I did not want to go. It's because I really had responsibilities also. Okay. Uh, you know, like I like I had mentioned, uh, still that uh, it, with working with my dad. Okay, so yeah. you know, with the home developments and stuff, that at that point was very lucrative. Okay, so at that point I was already a little older. You, you know, uh, I've been working with my dad at that point since I was fourteen. You know, so already knew the business. Um. And, you know, my early 20s, 22, 23, 24, I started getting more invested into the business because I just saw how lucrative it was. And I really liked the money that I was making. So that was my focus. Also, I didn't really want to go against my dad. Okay. He's still with me, by the way. He's 91 years old. God bless. Uh, you know, he, he's just such a hard worker. And my brother being five years younger than me, I still had to kind of take care of him also. And, and I mean, I don't know if that's traditional Latino lifestyle, but it was just my, my dad, my brother, myself. So we just took care of each other. Yeah. Um, everything else, you know, if I had time for it, great. If I did it, that's great too. It really yeah. was no sweat of my yeah. back. In a trip to Japan, whatever it was, you meant the week off. And if you got a business to run, and you're helping your dad, he's not even going to yeah. give you the time. So uh, I understand that. So, But you did venture into a little bit more MMA via John Peretti. 
and his battle cave. Now, this is an event to me that doesn't get enough credit. And I think that, was great. Yeah, you know, I think you got the UFC six, which is total chaos, and the after fight party. You know, you mentioned it was a fun party. I mean, you had Michael Buffer there, and right. The rumor I heard was that there was a tape of of him going around for a little while with his famous, you know, uh, "Are you ready to get laid?" And that's what he was, you know, screaming into a microphone somewhere. So it got pretty fun there, but. <laughs> John Peretti took it to a little bit more more of a sportive nature over in uh, Battlecade. How did you, you – I know John Peretti had a relationship with Phyllis, so why don't you fill us in? Right. So Phyllis is the one that introduced me to John Peretti. So, um, you know, I had given Phyllis my original packet, which wasn't, you know, the 70-something or whatever the hell it was, knockouts. Uh, it was just based on, you know, my, my local fights that I had. It was, at that point, 10-0. and 0. And that's what I had given to Phyllis, you know, and I said, hey, Phyllis, you know, this is it. This is just obnoxious marketing. It was just just kind of build me up for this thing to make me seem a little bit more dangerous. And she was, I don't even worry about that. It's not a big deal. You you know, so I I had, you know, a portfolio. So that's the portfolio that she handed John Peretti. Um, I think maybe a few months after the UFC fight, maybe um, maybe not even that long, maybe probably about a month because he was already setting up with Battlecade 1. And he calls me up and said, hey, uh, Rudyard, uh, my name is John Peretti. I just talked to Phyllis Lee. She says really good things about you. Um, how would you like to be in extreme fighting? This is, this is the way. And he showed me, and he pretty much gave me the detail. That's what the template for the UFC is. I think the, temp, I think the UFC just copied his template and just ran with it. Because he's the one that came up with um, the gloves, the rings, the time, the five-minute time limit. And it... It just sounded like a really good show. And I said, you know what? I, I would like to be part of this. So, yes. So at that point, my training just picked up. Okay. So I started training a little bit more. Um, I started uh, really training with some wrestling guys. And I think at that point, I had met Gene LaBelle and Goker. So I had been doing some training with them. I might be wrong in the timeline. I might have started training with them when I did uh, Extreme Fighting too. Uh, but at that point, my gra- my grappling game has started getting a lot better. I had started polishing up my my stand up, and so I was like, "Yeah, you know what? I'll, I'll do it. Let's. I, I think this is, you know, it's going to be fun." Okay. Well, uh, Peretti didn't. You know, this is one of the, the things here with Pat Str- Smith. You know, you're you're a newcomer and you walk into a guy who had already been in two tournaments, including a final. Like he's he right. won three fights in a night at UFC two. You know, right. a, a, it was a 16 man tournament, but that's you know that's about as veteran as you're going to get in that in that circle of people. And now here, you get about as an elite a grappler as you're ever going to see too. In Mario Sperry, so Mario Sperry, yeah, so much of a favor. So, um, yeah, Mario Sperry, that that was great. You know, unfortunately, you know there was a big size difference there too. Uh, yeah. My weight. My weight for that fight was 175, 180. And if you watch the fight, you can see that he's obviously a lot bigger than I am. For sure. Uh, he, he's probably at that point, maybe 220. He was a big guy, 215, 220, somewhere in there, maybe a little bit more. But you'll see the, the weight discrepancy. And that's one of the things that people don't really realize. It's not like I was fighting tomato cans. You know, I went up there and fought like the best of the best at that time. You know, so uh, Mario Sperry. Um I think I put up a good show. Uh, uh, Three minutes honestly, I was a, is, is extremely respectable. <laughs> right. uh, at that point, I was really afraid to throw my hands because from what I had already been been uh, told about him, and I'll say, well, you, you know, if he catches me, he's going to go to the floor and, you know, I'm going to probably maybe get up. Uh, but I definitely know he has the advantage here. So that was the my whole reasoning at that point was just not to let him take me to the floor and then just maybe um, outbox him. And, you know, so the outcome of that fight, he ended up winning. And Yeah, you know. and that was a tournament. So now, you know, I, I, I should maybe go back to the UFC 6 too. Do you watch the rest of the tournament or are you in a, you know, do you, are you finished for the night? Like, what did you think of the Sperry Zinovia fight? Because obviously, I think the that fight, was it. 
historic. I think, yeah, I think that was a great fight. I I had a feeling that the way the tournament was set up, that that's the fight that, uh, you know, everybody was vying for that John Credit really wanted. Uh, Igor did great. I had a feeling when, you know, because at that point I had become friends with Igor. And I, I just, I, I knew he would win. I, you know, there was no doubt in my mind that he would win that fight. Um, and it, I think just in itself, it was excellent. I had a front row seat. I sat right there from the ring. So I just watched the whole thing. And it, that that was pretty, pretty exciting just to watch him, you know, get the W. Now, now get this. So, so compare that to Tank and uh, Oleg, that which was the finals of UFC 6. I, I should have asked you that before, but, you know. We're having fun here. <laughs> yeah. So also with the UFC fight, you know, afterwards, you know, after my fight with Pat Smith, I went and sat in the audience, also front seat. And I was, you know, when, when, um, Tank and, Tank and, um, uh, Oleg started fighting, uh, that was actually a really good fight. You know, I was really surprised with how well Tank did, you, you know, and, uh, I was just, you know, it's like, wow, this guy's actually pretty good. He's giving Oleg a fight. And, you know, that, I, I don't remember how it ended. So, but I just remember being excited watching this, you know, watching yeah. it just firsthand. I'm pretty sure it, it was a long fight and Oleg finally wound up on his back and choked him out. Um, you know, where I think if I remember watching it on TV, Tank, you know, he had nothing left in, ter in terms of Tank Y in, in, the, in the gas tank. So, but right, I he guessed out. Definitely, you know, just the fact that you were front row at those two fights is 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 unbelievable. A little bit of history. Now, you know, you talked a little bit about partying too. You're from California. You go from right. Casper, Wyoming. That was in like Wilmington, North Carolina, and then Extreme Fighting it was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's not exactly like a world tour there, you know. <laughs> well, you know what? I what happened was. I went to a strip bar the night before uh, and I ended up meeting, you know, the girls and the girls and I, we went back. This is it. This is for extreme fighting, you know, because originally it's supposed to happen in New York. And then we ended up busting out to uh, uh, North, shit, Carolina. Well, North Carolina. That's right. Yeah. So we bust out to North Carolina and um, I went and looking around, you know, where we can go and got together with some of the guys. I think one of the guys was, John Freddie's friend, uh, John Donahue. I, it might have been a strip bar uh, or a nightclub that I went with him. But one of the one of the, the getaways was a strip bar. So I met the girls from the strip bar, and we went back to the you know my room, and we just had fun all night. You know, so that's the that's the number one thing. Uh, you know, it, it's going to sound funny being handsome and just having this weakness for women. It, you know, it was a very deterrent. Even though I was focused on the fight, my focus was did, redirected onto yeah. these women, and I just, you know, I don't regret it. It was fun, but it's, it's a it's a bugaboo in you know the history of fight. It's funny. I'll tell you, you know, very little. You know the famous Eddie Bravo, uh, Abu Dhabi match against Hoyler Gracie that he won. Yeah. Uh. I was one of the judges for that. So was John Donahue. <laughs> right. So I I know John pretty well, and and John's a very good guy and, and, and an excellent martial artist. But uh, right, yeah, yeah. fun too. Um, <laughs> um, so now so we're in Tulsa here in Tulsa. Now you come back, and I think you get a Matt Hume student, Todd Bjornton. Is that correct? Yeah, Todd Bjornton. Yeah. Okay, so that one was that was that one. I think that was a uh, extreme two, wasn't it, or extreme three? It, it that was on the internet, but I know even from the hook and shoot shows from those days that they get them wrong. So I'm not, I'm, you know, they, some of yeah, those things may not be correct. Yeah, that was a uh, that was a uh, battle K three. So, okay. so now my focus was a little bit more, um, you know, geared toward the sport. So, same thing. Uh, you know, with the penthouse pets, all that shit, you know, same, still same time frame, same mentality. However, this time I'm a li little bit more polished in my training. Uh, I was winning that fight. Uh, Todd B. Ornithin was getting banged up and he, he ended up winning with a heel hook. Okay. So that fight was a lot more, you know, even because we were about the same size. 
uh, I think probably the same skill level at that point, you know, and even though he was, he was losing, you know, pretty much the entire fight, um, he ended up grabbing me and I couldn't get away because I went in, I decided to go in with shoes. Okay. So I had my wrestling boots on. So that just really gave him a good grip and, you know, I, I was not able to get out and, you know, so kudos to him, took advantage of that shit. Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, what weight class was that in? Because Peretti had like, you know, the full five weight classes from the very start. And, uh, you know, you, you weren't a heavyweight. No, that was, he only had, I think, three weight classes at, at that one. Okay. I think, I'm not, I'm not sure, but re, it, it was middleweight and Todd and I were both 175. So talk a little bit about Peretti, though, uh, because, you know, you're all in two for him, and he's never a kind, uh, you know, judge or, you know, he, he's not a guy who, who might, you know, be encouraging, at least in, in, in general, what, what we've heard of him. What was he like behind the scenes? Did he want to have you back? Did he tell you, you know, you're not good enough? I mean, he could be that cold. No, he was never – he was never – and friendly with me him and i we hit it off right away we became friends um we haven't talked in the past year or so but i mean we're definitely friends um Good. he was never ever he never said anything disparaging about my skills or anything he gave me pointers on how you know how to win just what to do what to focus on and just you know he was that type of person and yes he is a direct kind of guy i i personally like that i like people that are direct and don't beat around the bush so when he talks to people, it's just very direct, as a matter of fact, manner. And that really puts a lot of people off. Um, you know, I, ch I chalk it up to his New York, you know. Yeah, you know, but I, I see that as a good thing, you know, and he does definitely say what's on his mind. You know, he'll he'll call it as he sees it, not necessarily how it is, you know, just definitely how he sees it. And, and, and he's he, very. He, the other, I, you know, knowing him a little bit. He's not a guy who just sees. He, he'll back it up with talk. You know, he's got he's got right. a good ability to you know be. He can be overbearing, but he can overpower yeah. people in a conversation. And then the thing I always liked about him too is that he was a two faceted kind of guy. In that he also you know was an extremely high level martial artist. Not, you know, in his own right, probably a guy you know ten years ahead of his time. Yeah, you know, he's really good stand up, and he was really good on the ground. He's a Gina Bell black belt. Also, you know, he went and trained on his own with, you know, different other styles. Um, every time, you know, I, I think I was like a, not an official because he did specifically ask me, hey, you know, you're in California, you have all these friends. Can you just, you, you know, whoever you think would do well, introduce me to him. So he'd fly out and, you know, a lot of the people that, that, um, that I met, I would introduce him to him. And so some of them ended up being on, on the show. Other words, other words, others. Did not. However, they were on the UFC later on when once he, you know, he was a matchmaker for UFC. You know, I've seen him put some hands on some people, you know, when, we, when we'd spar and stuff and some other some people just went in there and, you know, they took him for granted. Uh, he's hit me pretty hard a few times. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one time we were sparring and he just kicked me so hard right beside my head. OK, and he has some shell, some tor tortoise on his on, on his insteps. And I go, dude, what the hell? Why'd you kick me so? Why'd you kick me? He goes, oh, because they're hard. Or it, it was just funny at the at the moment. It, it was funny, you know, painful but funny. And that's just the way he is. You, you know, he's just he doesn't mean anything by it. You know, he just really wants to test the skills, and you, you, that's that's just the way he is. Yeah, you may you may allude to the fact that he, after the battle cage shut down, he became UFC matchmaker in the era before Zufa. Right. And, you know, that was really the best times for the UFC until, you know, Zufa came along and took it over there. But he did provide that transitional step. A lot of people don't realize that. And he, he belongs in the Hall of Fame in my book. Yeah. Uh, I had two other opportunities to fight in the UFC. Uh, one time I turned it down. And then the other time I took advantage of it. I said, yes, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to fight. Uh, I think I was scheduled to fight this guy named Brad Gum or Shoney Carter. It was one of those two guys. Yeah. I ended up tearing my rotator cuff really bad, so I was out. At that point, my recovery from that, it it 
probably was about a year for full recovery, maybe a little bit more. And at that point, I said, you know what, uh, I've put effort into this, you know, but I'm going to keep my focus on this other areas because it's just it just had picked up. So I really, you know, as a young man, that's the worst thing you can do is to divide the mind. You know, and I just really felt divided. I felt, you know, pulled in this direction, pulled in this other direction. And I just had at that point so many options that it was really hard to pick one and just go with it. So I just started eliminating things out of my life and went with what really I felt I needed to do for myself. Yeah, now, what did Peretti pay you for the extreme fighting uh, for the battle cave? Was that five? Did you get five grand there, too? That was also five grand uh, plus uh, five hundred dollars uh, per diem. It was one hundred dollars a day per diem. So five thousand plus five hundred. Okay, um, cool. he was a little yeah. bit more generous. Yeah, the bottom line is, is uh, you know, for the ninety-five, ninety-six time frame, uh, pay would actually take a step back in the years to come before it got back to that. You know, so yeah, uh, you know, you might not have done it at all if it had been you know a few years later. You're a real pioneer there with some of the early stuff. Um, and then, uh, you still watch the sport. Say it again. You still watch. You know what? Uh, not as much. I'm not a big fan of the sport. I feel like, um, you know, once, not that it's a trick or anything like that, but I feel like, uh, you know, once you know the trick, you kind of lose interest in it. You know, like a magician, when you see behind the scenes and how the trick is done. Uh, that was me. That was my experience with it. I, I lost most of my interest on it. There's really no fighters uh, around anymore that really just piqued my interest in the fight. Uh, right now, for me, it's just a curiosity. I'll read about it, but I won't go out of my way and hang out with my friends or pay for it or, you know, I, I don't go out of my way for it. You know, I don't watch it illegally. That's not what I'm alluding to. <laughs> Nothing like that. Right. It's just, it's really a non-entity for me. You know, if I want to look at the results, I will pull up SureDog or something and I'll just read the results. And and basically that's it. It's just a curiosity at this point in my life. It's really, you know, and, and that's just it. That's cool. Um, you moved on, you know, and, and, and you know, the better things, so it's no big deal. Uh, I'll share an experience with you as we close out here. With a, a friend of mine, a guy who fought a couple of times in the UFC, and, you know, he, he did 50 fights in MMA, uh, a guy named Dave Strasser. Now, retired and stuff, he comes on the podcast, and uh, I think this was on the eve of the major fight between Anderson Silva and Chael Sonnen. And, I, you know, I was like, you know, what do you think is going to happen? And he says that I haven't watched the UFC in five years. <laughs> you, you know, and I think a lot of you guys share that experience. You, you move on. Yeah. Well, with that being said, I have a lot of respect for anybody that will step into the ring or the octagon or anything like that. It takes a lot of balls, a lot of gumption to get in there. Uh, it really, you know, it's a different breed of person that will actually put it on the line. OK, I don't agree with a lot of uh, the armchair quarterbacks and then just that you know, I would have done this or I would have done that. Now, I'm, I think, Guy, you're you're probably sitting there eating Cheetos, you know, telling a real athlete what to do. You know, so and anybody that steps into your competitive arena, I think they're just at, at a different level than most people. And that's just like the 3% people out there. No, and for sure, I mean, as we close out, let's just give this man a little bit of credit and, uh, and just a simple analysis. He he shows up in Casper, Wyoming. Wyoming is not New York City. You know, this is what's going on in that town. It's the focus of everything. He's in a tournament. Everybody in the tournament is bigger. Most of them already experienced in this, and this is his first fight. And he's got to deal with two, three days of seeing them in the hotel and the intimidation yeah. of everybody there. You know, it's not like Tank Abbott held doors open for this guy. You yeah. know what I mean? It's, it's so just the, just the tension of being there is something – very few people could ever handle, you know, could ever handle. And, you know, I don't want to say, you know, maybe Rutger was, was confident that day, or maybe he had a little bit of a sinking feeling when he saw, you know, that he was more or less there to party and that some of the other guys were, you know, frigging spitting nails, you know? So just consider that experience, the pressure of that, and then having to perform, you know, in your underwear. It's, it's, it's a, an unbelievable experience, and that's why I wanted to have you on here because I knew that that separates you from the other ninety nine percent for sure. Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate it. I enjoyed doing this. And uh, you know, we'll keep in touch. Uh, it'll be listed on the MMA Museum. I'll send you a link here, and we'll publish it before the end of the month. You got it. Thanks, man. Thanks, Miguel. Take it easy, man.